Hey everybody, it's Anna and welcome back to my booktube channel. This video is going to be the first of a two-parter that I have decided to make as a sort of like special edition of my usual geekly wrap-ups because I wanted to make some videos about books that defined 2019 for me and then another video about games and other geeky experiences that define 2019 for me. So if you are watching this now and the second half of the video is up, I will go ahead and leave it linked linked up top uh, and you can head over and watch that as well. So when I was thinking about the books that defined 2019 for me, I give a lot of books <laughs> five star ratings. I think that my like average on Goodreads is a 4.1 and I think that's just because that as I've gotten older and I've become more acquainted with my reading tastes, I've been selecting more for books that I'm pretty sure that I'm going to enjoy, um, even if they don't like become my favorites, that they're going to be a quality reading experience there in the time. But when I was trying to figure out what books I wanted to include in this video, um, I really wanted to pick the books that um, stuck with me the most even after reading them. So these are books that I gave pretty high ratings to, all of them, but also books that have kind of stayed with me both intellectually and emotionally after I finished reading them. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and get into those. The first book that stuck with me that defined 2019 was Devotions, which is the selected poems of Mary Oliver. Mary Oliver is one of my favorite uh, poets. She used to be my favorite living American author and then sadly she passed away towards the beginning of 2019. And I remember being in the bookstore because I was all excited to go out and get this book and that was the day that she died. And I was there standing around the poetry table with a bunch of other older ladies that had come in to buy her books. And I remember all of us just standing there crying together, you know, mourning her, celebrating the things that she had taught us, celebrating the great comfort that the poetry of Mary Oliver has brought to us. And just, that was definitely like a defining moment in my reading life, not just for 2019, but I think I'll look back on that as a defining moment in my life as a reader at large. And I have turned to this book time and time again, the way that people turn towards like their spiritual text of choice for comfort throughout the year. I read the poems slowly to myself out loud when I'm having a bad day, when I'm having a good day, when I'm having trouble falling asleep, anything like that. Mary Oliver just has a poem for every occasion. And although I'm really sad that she's no longer with us, I'm so grateful that I was alive at this time to read the books that she wrote. All right, I think the next one that I read, this is somewhat loosely chronological, I guess. I read pretty early in the year as well, and that is Bloodwater Paint by Joy McCullough. I've actually seen this show up on a couple of people's best books of 2019, but not too many. I think because maybe it was like a big deal when it came out, but it came out kind of early in the year, so I didn't see a lot of people talking about it later in the year. But this is a novel told in verse that is the story of Artemisia Gentileschi, who is, or who was a um, painter during the Renaissance, and when she was a young woman, she was raped by her teacher in the art studio where she was learning how to paint and be an artist. And this is when she was just a teenager, and it's notable historically because she was the first person who was able to actually... Um, sue her rapist in court and win. Actually, her father was the one that had to sue because she couldn't legally bring suit as a woman, and he actually sued for property damage, um, not rape, because that's how that was covered under the law at the time. And she went on to paint a, a magnificent painting of the biblical scene of Judith beheading Holofernes, kind of as this response to uh, what she had experienced as somebody that survived rape in her life. As somebody that is myself a survivor, I found this story to be incredibly moving, incredibly powerful. I had to stop reading it and just whoo, breathe a couple of times throughout because especially when she talks about being, you know, tortured with thumbscrews and as a painter being the person that like relies on her hands to do her work and the legal establishment did not believe her to the extent that they decided that they needed to torture her in order to determine whether she was telling the truth or not and how she still got back up after that and began painting again is just incredible. I was really fortunate that at the Seattle Art Museum there was an exhibit this year where they were featuring um, her portrait or her painting of Judith beheading Holofernes, so I actually got to see it in real life. It was amazing. <laughs> I had a moment there, and yeah, 
this book definitely enhanced my experience of looking at that painting. Okay, next up are two books that I read for the Indigathon, which was um, an indigenous readathon that was co-hosted by Brody and Michelle, and that happened in, um, in uh, during Native Heritage Month, which is the month of November. So the entire month of November, I focused on reading books that were by indigenous authors about indigenous characters. The first one I don't have with me anymore because I got it from the library, but it's called Mama Sketch, A Cree Coming of Age by Daryl J. McLeod. This was a memoir and also a first literary work ever by Daryl J. McLeod, who writes about being a young Cree boy coming of age um, in Canada, coming to terms with his queerness and his family's history with residential schools and mistreatment at the hands of the government and the Catholic Church. He writes about um, growing up with a parent in the home that had like untreated mental illness and substance abuse issues and trying to both care for himself and care for his siblings and the story was really powerful. I could not believe that this man wrote something that was like just so beautiful straight out of the gate. He had never written any like published creative writings before but he just had such a way with words and it felt like I was sitting down and listening to somebody tell their family stories. And then there was another book that I read for Indigathon, another poetry collection actually, called An American Sunrise by Joy Harjo, who is the current Poet Laureate of the United States. And this is a poetry collection that reckons with her family's um, history as pertains to the Trail of Tears and being involved in the Jazz Age in Oklahoma up until her, you know, experiences as a native woman in the modern era as a native poet etc this poetry collection also really stuck with me because it was extremely powerful to read again because i felt very honored to be listening to these type of family stories i think that that's one of the most precious things that you can share with the world um so i really appreciate that i was allowed <laughs> to share and enjoy harjo's stories that way by reading these poems Okay, next up is a book that I recommended to a lot of folks for the Indigathon, um, but I had already read it before, so I didn't count it, but that was Gods of Jade and Shadow by Silvia Moreno-Garcia, and this is a story about a girl named Cassiopeia that lives in Mexico in the Jazz Age, and she opens up a mysterious box in her grandfather's office and unknowingly releases Hunkame, who is like the ancient uh, Mayan god of death, into the world. This was a really fascinating, um, I guess like historical but also fantasy story, also kind of magical realism. Like this was a year of me maybe realizing I actually like magical realism more than I thought. Um, but I picked this up because I was really intrigued by the gorgeous cover and I'm glad that I was because the story inside was fabulous. I've gifted this book a couple of times throughout the year um, and I am really looking forward to reading more by this author. Speaking of books that I gifted a lot during this time of year, this is probably not going to surprise anybody, but I also thought that Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston was a defining reading experience for me in 2019. I think that this was the year that a lot of like queer joy really came into its own on the page and burst out of more than just the like high school stories that YA had been in, um, interacting with, and now we have full-on queer joy on the page. I know that <laughs> this is a book that probably everybody has heard of. I know that there are some divisive opinions out there about it, but just reading this put the biggest goofy smile on my face with happiness. And again, being at the book signing with Casey and just a room full of happy queers being excited together was one of my favorite experiences of my reading life, I think. Okay, let's see, what else do I have here? All right, so this uh, year was also what brought us the inaugural uh, book quest for the bookie grail, during which I read The Last Unicorn by Peter S. Beagle, because this is a fantasy classic that I hadn't read yet. I'm sad that I slept on it this long, uh, even though I did know the story because I had watched the movie as a kid, but reading this book just felt like coming home. Coming home to a place that I have always felt that I belong in books, in like a fantasy type of story. That's just where I feel like I'm most alive and I'm most myself as a reader is when I am in a fantasy or sci-fi world and like fully immersed in that. And this book was both an homage to the entire genre and a 
extremely like inventive and innovative tale in its own. I recommend that everybody read this and I recommend that everybody reread this because I know that this is a book that is going to continuously enrich me throughout my life and I can't wait to go back and give it another shot. Okay, also during the bookie trials and the reading rush this year, I read an amazing queer story called Out of Salem by Hal Shreve. I also feel like this was the year that I, in particular, really found my home among um, non-binary and trans writers, especially because this was the year that like I came to the realization that I myself am non-binary and that's okay and that's something that I can actually say out loud and be proud about. And this book really helped me along the way with that because pretty much everybody in this book is like queer and envy and badass and I really enjoyed it. This book also has a lot of things to say about disability and bodily difference under the um, auspices of like monstrous figures from literature. So there are zombie characters, there are werewolf characters, um, almost all of those like sort of fantastical characters are queer in some way and in this book there are a lot of uh, analogs drawn between you know things like conversion therapy and other you know mistreatments that the queer community has suffered that also like translate to the more fantastical aspects of these people but this was an amazing story about the importance of resisting authoritarianism and small-mindedness um, broadening your horizons going outside of your comfort zone and creating solidarity with your fellow people fellow human beings I loved this book. I loved the fact that it was by a non-binary author. I want to read it again. I recommend everybody who's interested read this. Speaking of also coming to terms with non-binary identity, um, another book that really helped me through this journey this year was Gender Queer, which is a memoir by Maya Kobabe. Um, this is also a graphic novel memoir. Graphic memoir, I guess it is. Um, and this is a book that I actually picked up randomly because I was waiting around in a bookstore coffee shop to meet up with a friend and I was like oh I guess I'll just like browse the books because what else am I going to do while I wait for my friend to get there and I picked this book up I think I started crying like in the first chapter of it because so many of the things that Maya talks about in this book even if it wasn't my exact life experience resonated with me so deeply that I knew I had to have it. So I went back up to the barista and just sort of like tearfully eyed went, I have to have this book. I have to take it with me. And she was like, okay, okay, it's going to be all right. She offered to give me a hug. It was really nice. But I really enjoyed this book. This is about um, your coming of age as a young non-binary kid and also like we have so many things in common the two of us just like our love of lord of the rings of tamora pierce um our varying levels of comfortability in our bodies and like how our bodies are viewed by other people in the world and how um god i'm getting like choked up just talking about this but i really really loved this book and i think it definitely defined the year for me Speaking of more non-binary authors, this year during Queer Lit Readathon and also the bookie Trials Winter Quest, I read The Deep by River Solomon, which is a book that I think is like taking the slow creep approach towards uh, taking over all of booktube silently but powerfully, and I am so happy about this. This is a story by a black non-binary autistic author um, who wrote a story about what would happen if uh, the people that had jumped off of the slave ships during to escape the transatlantic slave trade instead of drowning had survived and kind of formed this entire secret civilization of like mer people and sirens I guess they're not exactly like western ideas of mer folk but they're like black folks that live underwater and swim and have tails and gills and stuff like that so mermaid is not exactly it but it's the best analog I can think of to explain this and this is a story about one of the uh one of this group of people that is basically like the repository of the entire civilization's shared memory and trauma and history because it's too heavy for everybody else to carry all the time so this one person has been designated to be the repository of an entire civilization's memory 
at all times. This also then ended up being a story that had some very powerful things to say about climate change, which is not what I expected from the first half of the book. But for such a slim book particularly, this just blew me away. I have been constantly thinking about this book ever since I finished reading it. I know that it's um, kind of like a a literary game of telephone almost because it's based off of I think a rap that was based off of a concept album or something like that and I need to go and listen to the music that this is based off of because this book was really incredible. Okay then I have a book that I read really recently towards the end of the year and that was Mary Toft or the Rabbit Queen by Dexter Palmer. This is a book that I kind of picked up randomly in a bookstore when Sean and I were on our like winter break trip in Philadelphia and I picked it up because this is a story about one of my favorite uh, moments in history, like historical medical hoaxes about a woman who allegedly um, in 18th century England was giving birth to rabbits. Um, she was not, in fact, giving birth to rabbits, but I thought that this book had a lot of really interesting things to say that were not just confined to a singular century's discussions of how we know what we know and what types of methods do we consider reliable for determining what is true about the world. I think that it had a lot of important commentary and lessons for issues that we face today, but also like was firmly rooted in those same discussions of the 18th century, and I could really just see through this book the level of care and detail and attention and research that went into writing this. It kind of reads like it's a fiction from the 18th century. It's a novel that comes with bibliography and notes, which makes my geeky little heart just sing. And I'm going to be rereading this book in 2020 because I want to make a more in-depth discussion video about my thoughts about this book and why I think it's important for everybody to read. So coming in at the last, last minute, but definitely a defining reading experience of 2019. And then the final book is probably not going to surprise anybody because this year I read the entire Wayfarers trilogy by Becky Chambers, which is a sort of space opera, sci-fi kind of story that's incredibly queer, um, incredibly diverse. It does things that I think showcase science fiction at its best and similar to The Last Unicorn when I was reading these books it made me really feel like I was coming home. But the book out of the entire trilogy that I think defined the year of 2019 the most for me was A Closed and Common Orbit which is the second book and it is the story of Pepper who is one of the side characters from the first book and Lovelace who is the AI that runs the ship in the first book and it is <sighs> the most powerful story of friendship and artificial intelligence and questions of humanity and consciousness that I think I have read in my life ever. Yes, I'm going to go there. This book made me cry. <laughs> Two robotic things in 2019 made me cry. One of them was Oppie, the Mars rover that died, and one of them was this book because this makes you feel for something that by our standards today we would not consider human, but it asks you to consider the humanity of things that you consider inhuman. And it kind of just broke my heart open to read this book. I really loved it. I cried throughout the last half reading it, cried on a park bench reading it. It was amazing. Um, I definitely would recommend the entire trilogy to everybody that watches this channel, because if you watch this channel, we probably have similar tastes. But that book in particular, I think, stuck with me the most. So those are the books that defined my experience of reading in 2019. Um, I know I've talked a lot with y'all about these books so far, but if you're new to this channel or if you'd like to uh, talk with me about any of the ones that you saw mentioned here, leave me a comment. Um, also, if you uh, like these videos and you're interested to see more of what I do, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on your way down to the comments. Um, I will be posting my part two of this video, which is going to be more of my like favorite other geeky experiences of 2019. So look forward to that as well. As always, thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.